Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Saturday, August 6th, 2022, and today we're going to be talking about the state of Minnesota's first congressional district. This Tuesday, Minnesota's first district will be having a special election, a regular election that will determine which political party fills the vacancy in this district until the November midterm elections. Now, Minnesota's first district has been vacated by a representative who unfortunately passed away. This was a Republican representative, so largely speaking, we should expect a Republican to win here. The first district has gone back and forth between Democrats and Republicans in the past. The governor of the state of Minnesota, Tim Walz, actually held this seat before becoming the governor, though in his last election prior to becoming the governor, he won by about 0.5%. So this district had always been pretty competitive. If you take a look at the map and take a look at the history behind it, it has gone back and forth, uh, but more recently has started to shift in favor of the GOP. Now, the candidate here, uh, Brian Finstad, I believe that's his name, or maybe I'm getting the name correctly, Brad Finstad, I knew it started with a B, uh, is running in a district as this open Republican who is just sort of putting himself in the race uh, due to the vacancy that was there. This is not an incumbent. This is not some type of race where you have a very well-established name. He's not a state senator. He's not a state representative. He is simply the Republican who is nominated by their primary. Now, the reason why I mentioned candidate is because you might recognize Minnesota's first district as a competitive seat from the last election. And that's because in the 2020 House elections, the incumbent there only won by about three percentage points. Now, this is the incumbent who unfortunately now has passed away, but his margin here wasn't exactly that strong. It was a three-point lead when Donald Trump, on the other hand, was winning in this district by about 10 points across it. So what you saw there was about a seven-point underperformance for the Republican in Minnesota's first, which does say that Democrats at least have some level of ability to win in this district or do better than national Republicans are, uh, you know, or expect them to do based off of their presidential results. This is one of the very few congressional districts where the congressional Democrat did significantly better than Joe Biden did. And it is something that Democrats are holding on to as a hope to potentially win this first district this upcoming Tuesday. But the reason why I'm making a video about it is because this will be an additional test of the GOP's ability to win in the upcoming midterms or potentially their uh, inability to win by as large margins as they did in the 2020 election. And the reason why I think this is so important is because we will see again, as we have seen in every single thing past the Dobbs decision, whether or not there is a bump for Democrats that is noticeable across these elections, across these polls, and expected to be in this November. Now, the Minnesota 1st District has been polled by just one singular pollster. There also was a poll that was done by uh, a, a Democratic internal pollster. Now, that Democratic internal pollster was uh, done, I think, way back in June. We can go ahead and find that. But that one I want to completely disregard. I don't like to use partisan polls. But to be fair, we barely have any information. It was a Democratic partisan poll that has the Democrats losing by just one point. But the Survey USA poll, which actually has done very well in the state of Minnesota in the past, shows Brad Finstad ahead by about eight points district-wide. So I would trust that number a lot more. I would say that's definitely one that makes a lot more sense, especially considering the partisan composition of the district. But who knows at this point in time? And looking at past special elections in 2022, there are two that come to mind when I think about what is happening right now in the state of Minnesota. The first one is Texas's 34th congressional district, in which Myra Flores went ahead and won this district with 51% of the vote. 51% is significant, not because it was this extraordinary number, but rather because this was a Biden district. In addition to that, when you take a look at the uh, 34th district in the 2020 election, you might actually be interested to see what you find. In the last election, let's head over and take a look at what actually happened here. The margin of victory for the Democratic incumbent was 14 points. So this district was pre-Dobbs decision. It also is in an area where I don't exactly think the Dobbs decision would have had that much of an effect in terms of a benefit for the Democratic Party. But what had happened here was the Republican Party took a district, which sure was Biden plus four, but more notably Democrat plus 14 and flipped it. They took nearly a safe congressional district and had a Republican win, not even heading off into the runoff election. Didn't need one. It was able to go ahead and just end there because Myra Flores got above 50% of the vote. So this district in specific was a very good showing for the GOP. And if Republicans are able to outperform where Donald Trump was in the last election, I don't really compare it to the congressional result because that just had to do with an unfortunate Republican candidate there. But the presidential result is really what I would use as my baseline. 
Because if the Republicans do better than this, it means that in not every part of the country was there a positive impact for the Democratic Party following the Dobbs decision. The other special election I wanted to think about actually concurs with my point that there was a positive impact, at least in the immediate aftermath following the Dobbs decision for the Democratic Party. Nebraska's first congressional district held a special election on June 28th. This was five days after the Roe v. Wade decision. Roe v. Wade dropped on a Friday. This election was on a Tuesday. And in the final stretch of the campaign, abortion became a very mainstream issue. Now, Patty Pansing Brooks was a Democrat who definitely approached this district differently than many other Democrats might have. After the election, Patty Pansing Brooks submitted a criticism to the National Democratic Party saying that they don't connect with rural voters the way that she was able to do, that they don't put the effort in, whatever it might be. And the criticism, while I say, uh, you know, was definitely exemplified by media and Democratic colleagues, I don't know if it actually was going to contribute to a change in strategy. But regardless, there was something here that worked for Democrats that I can't say was able to be replicated in many other predominantly rural districts across the United States. But it wasn't just Patty Pansing Brooks using her uh, you know, uh, ability to connect with rural voters in a way that other Democrats might not have. It was also the Dobbs decision. As I said in the five days leading into this election, abortion became a very mainstream issue, and the Republican Mike Flood actually defended his position on a law in, uh, in Nebraska that prohibits a woman's right to an abortion after a certain point. Patty Panting Brooks, on the other hand, used it to go on the offense against the GOP. And on that Tuesday election, Patty Panting Brooks, the Democrat, only lost by five points district-wide. If you want to take a look at the congressional election results uh, in terms of the candidate there, we can take a look. But we can also look at the presidential results. We saw the Texas 34th. We saw the Minnesota 1st. So what happened in the Nebraska 1st District? What was the margin of victory there? I don't know why. I just went, went ahead and scrolled all the way down there. But in Nebraska's 1st District, Donald Trump received 56% of the vote to Joe Biden's 41, a 15-point margin that translated to a five-point margin in the special election. And the reason why that is more significant is because 2022 is a red wave year. It's a year that is expected to be very, very good for the GOP. And the 34th district election confirmed that. But in Nebraska, it didn't confirm that. In fact, it indicated that the election might be worse off in November for the GOP because it joins a very similar company, not necessarily Nebraska's first in specific, but congressional districts in past years that have had special elections that have led into midterms that look very different than what the Republican Party is expecting this November. Very briefly, let's talk about the election results in 2020. In Nebraska's first, Fortenberry won that election by 22 points. But here's the caveat here. This congressional district was different. It was drawn under different lines, and Donald Trump actually ended up winning the other new district by still double digits. I'm not entirely sure. I think 11 or 12 points. But the difference is astounding because in every single special election that we have seen, practically everyone at least, following Glenn Youngkin's victory in Virginia, the Republican Party has done better. They have done uh, increase their margin. They've started to expand. And now we didn't exactly see that in Nebraska. And the one thing that has changed is the stance and issue of abortion across the United States. In addition to that, what I will say is that we also see it on the generic ballot. We also see it in terms of statewide races and some congressional races as well. In areas where abortion is now one of the more important issues, and it also is the second most important issue nationwide now, wasn't even an issue in the top 10, you know, three, four, five months ago. But, you know, looking at that, clearly something is helping the Democratic Party. And I think that what we will now see and expect to see in Minnesota could tell us if it, if it translates to districts, if it's able to be found in some of these special elections in races that should otherwise easily go to the GOP. Minnesota's first district is a district that Donald Trump won by double digits in the last election. It's a district that Republicans held and were able to win in 2020. So to see it now, I mean, Republicans even won it in 2018 during uh, a blue wave year. If it does narrow up to a margin that is similar with a non-popular or, or a more popular and more electable Republican than the ones that they have put up in the past, if Republicans underperform. Where Donald Trump was in 2020, that is a red flag. That is a warning sign. What I was talking about with Nebraska is that that special election joined the likes that you saw in 2017 or 2018. 
not the 2018 November elections, but the special elections leading into it. For instances, in Kansas's 4th District, Ron Estes defeated James Thompson by about six points district-wide. Donald Trump won here by double digits. Montana at large, a four or five point margin. Again, Donald Trump won here by double digits. Georgia's sixth district. Donald Trump was able to do well here. Actually, the previous Republican Tom Price won by 30 a year prior. Guess what happens? Karen Handel defeats, yes, John Ossoff, who is now a senator from Georgia, by about three, four points. Very much narrowing up. South Carolina's 5th District, a Donald Trump double-digit district. Ralph Norman, the Republican, defeats Archie Parnell by a margin of about four points. Very, very narrowing up within the race. In nearly every single special election, we saw it get narrower than where it was in 2016 because we were heading into a blue wave year. To see a state like Nebraska and the district in Nebraska itself narrow up from what was double digits for Trump down to just five points for a Republican in an expected Republican wave year, clearly something went wrong, and that something very likely has to do a lot with Roe v. Wade being overturned. So I don't know entirely what to expect from the state of Minnesota, but I am interested to see how we will see it characterized following what was released. Because right now the expectation is the same expectation that we had for Republicans in terms of the presidential level in Minnesota's first district, that it was going to be solid Republican. But here's the thing. In Nebraska's election, it was expected to be solid Republican as well. The predictions here were solid, safe, solid, safe. No one, and I mean no one, expected this special election to be competitive. And yet it was. The Democrat underfundraised the Republican. The results did not seem to be doing too well. And Democrats did better by 10 points relative to the last election. So in the state of Minnesota, seeing this likely and solid Republican characterization, I trust it. And I think, you know, it was accurate to the extent that it predicted the correct winner in Nebraska. But I am wondering if there will be a narrowing up as a result of Democrats starting to do better nationwide. As gas prices go down, as abortion becomes a more mainstream issue, especially in a state where Democrats have been successful very much in the past. Minnesota is a state in terms of the overall percentage of voters across it that believe abortion should be legalized in the state. You're talking 54% to 40%, a 14-point advantage for the Democratic Party's position over the Republican Party in a state that Biden won by eight points. Minnesota is a state that has voted for Democrats in the past, and the first district has as well. But the question is, do you put yourself in a position, do you end up in a position where, you know, now Minnesota is going to go to the Republican Party? Is this first district going to listen to what happened at the Supreme Court and use that to benefit the Democratic Party? Relative to this last Republican, again, like I said, it doesn't look too good for the Republican Party or too you know, bad for the Democratic Party, meaning that they have a realistic shot at victory. But that presidential margin is a lot of what we're looking at here, because this isn't going to be the Republican incumbent. Clearly, there was a significant underperformance between Donald Trump's margin in Minnesota's first and the Republican nominee. There is a very clear difference in now removing that Republican nominee for very, very unfortunate decisions. You now are putting yourself back into a standard open race where people typically revert to how they vote in a presidential election. Because honestly speaking, they don't know much about how some of these Republicans or Democrats are going to govern. And thus, you start to see it revert back to its overall average. But if we don't see that, then something might be happening for the national GOP. This first district will be yet another test for the issue of abortion and the Democratic Party's chances for this November. I would not want to be a Republican on this upcoming Wednesday if Republicans don't do well in this first district. If they don't win by the eight points that Survey USA says or more, it definitely will be alarming because this is a Trump district. This is an area where Democrats don't exactly see themselves as winning. And God forbid for the GOP, the Democrats do win here. If Democrats win here, completely throw out practically anything that Republicans try to argue in terms of it being a red wave. I think that honestly speaking, if Democrats were to win here, we would be on track for Democrats to retain control of the House, retain control of the Senate, and make major, major pickups across the country, which is why I think it is very unreasonable and unlikely to expect this to happen. But then again, crazier things have happened in American politics. I think our standard expectation should be that the Republican does win here, but the margin is what I am excited to look at. 
because it could show that the Republican Party is still able to maintain their lead that they have had for the past eight months and that it isn't impacting every part of the country. Some states are going to view this as more important than others because maybe there's an abortion ballot uh, referendum on the ballot. Maybe there's uh, you know some vehemently pro-life or pro-choice candidates on the ballot as well. Those things might start to uh, you know really make things more competitive. But for a House election, these things are supposed to be the most responsive to the president's approval rating, to the national generic ballot, and the overall sentiment of the nation against or for either political party. And if Republicans don't come out ahead by eight points or more, I would definitely say there is something off. I would honestly say if it isn't higher than Donald Trump's 2020 margin of victory, something is off. Because 2022 is expected to be a year where Republicans are severely outperforming where they were in 2020 and especially 2018. And if that doesn't happen, not in the way that, you know, we are overwhelmingly expecting it to, well, that means that this is going to indicate something is going wrong for the national Republicans and that their strategy and messaging is being bogged down by something that something very likely being the Dobbs decision from the United States Supreme Court. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2022 election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all tomorrow.